like to now introduce to you John Powell. He's going to be uh, presenting something that's going to be filmed and distributed. John holds a PhD from UCLA and has been teaching and researching physiology for 42 years at Ohio University. He has been a recipient of numerous grants and awards. He currently serves as a teacher's assistant in the Department of Classics and World Religions. He is the co-founder and coordinator of the Democracy Over Corporations group in Athens, Ohio. About monetary reform and the need for reform in general. He will especially describe how the banking system, in effect, creates what we use for money, out of thin air. He has developed one of the best presentations that we have seen on that in 2014. John gave one of the clearest, most inspiring talks on the problem of fractional reserve banking, or what's called fractional reserve banking, and using debt in place of money, and has established himself as a premier monetary reform presenter. We are working to have his presentation distributed amongst members of the public, including Green Party members nationwide. Please give a warm welcome to John Howe. Well, Jamie's talk was for the experts looking at the details of this, and my talk is designed for the person who has never heard about this stuff before, because that's the way I've used this talk. Uh, so readjust your thinking and pretend that you don't know anything about this stuff, and then uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be in a position to, uh, uh, to, uh, to appreciate uh, what my approach is. So it's a simple one. Uh, I've entitled it in, th in this way because I gave this uh, talk in the medical school where I teach at Ohio University, and I wanted to emphasize things that are related to the people in the medical school. So, but the fact is, monetary policy affects everything else in the economy, and this is a quote that's familiar to many of you from, from Henry Ford, that it's well enough that people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system, or if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. Well, start simple. What is the economy but an exchange of goods and services? And the, the, uh, 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 the economy, uh, because the exchange of goods, goods and services is mediated by money, the economy can be viewed as circulation of money. The question is, where does this money come from? Well, there are two options. Money comes either from, as created by the government, or it's created by banks. Now, in today's world, money is created by banks, as debt, when they extend credit, that is to say, when they make loans. Well, because it is only created as debt, society only has money if it has debt. Now, people naturally think it's better to be without debt. But in the current system, without debt, we wouldn't have any money. So, this system, uh, as illustrated here, oops, there it is, okay. Uh, what, what you see is that uh, uh, money is created by banks as loans, and of course this money is fed into the system, the, the economy, and it's taken back out as money, as the loans are repaid to the banks. And in addition, of course, the banks are taking out loan interest. So this comes as a surprise to many people because they ask, well, doesn't the government office of engraving and printing produce our paper money? And doesn't the US Mint produce our coins? And of course, the answer is um, with regard to coins that the government via the US Mint does create the coins. It can make four quarters for about 11 cents each, take them to the bank and get a, get a dollar. That's 56 cents profit for the government per dollar, seniorage. What about bills? Bills are Federal Reserve notes and they're printed by the Federal Bureau of Engraving and Printing and they too cost about 11 cents a piece to make. And the Bureau though sells them to the Federal Reserve Bank for the cost of production, 11 cents each. 
So what was worth 11 cents is now in the hands of the bank worth $1 or $100 in the case of a $100 bill. The banking system gets the profit from the currency creation as they provide cash to their customers in exchange for account money. That is to say checks, including people's paychecks. And people raise the question, of course, but aren't the Federal Reserve Banks owned by the U.S. government? And the answer is no. The Federal Reserve Board of Governors is a government agency. It's a policy-making agency and a regulatory agency, but it is not a bank. The board governs policy and procedures for the 12 Federal Reserve Banks, which are all owned by the private commercial banks in the region of the country they serve. Federal Reserve Bank employees are not government employees. Now what about account money? Because this is the big one. Most of, our, most of the money in circulation is account money. It's not in the form of bills or coins. So about, at least 95% of the US economy is account money, existing only as records in computers. All account money is created by banks when they make loans or buy securities. So the conclusion is that except for coins, money is really created by banks, not for the government. As a matter of fact, if the government created money, it would not have to borrow money. It would not be in debt. Okay, banks put the loan principle into the economy, but they take out both, oops. They take out both the principle and the loan interest. So what that means is, they take out more than they put in. Yet they're the ones who provide our money supply. How can this work if they're taking out more than they put in? Well, it's only possible when lending here stays ahead of repayment, because that means money is going into the, uh, in, into the uh, economy. So when lending stays ahead of repayment, the money supply does grow. And money is plentiful and times are good, but of course debt is growing. And of course, when lending fails to stay ahead of repayment rates, the account of money in the economy shrinks. Depressions and recessions occur, jobs are lost, people suffer. Now, when governments create money, the money is created by the government, put into circulation. The government also takes out taxes, but those taxes typically are spent back into the, into the economy as well. So money created by the government is spent into circulation, producing jobs, allowing the economy to grow. So when government creates money, the rate of money creation is tied to the growth of the real economy, eliminating boom and bust cycles. There is no debt from money creation. Money created by the government can pay down the national debt as it comes due. So based on this simple comparison, which is better? Money created by the government, which is money created as money as a public asset, or money created as debt by the banks as a public liability? Well, Let's look a little bit more closely at what happens when banks make loans. And this is a bank, a simplified bank balance sheet. So assets are here, I keep pressing this button. So assets are here on the left, liabilities are on the right. Assets are, of course, what the bank owns and what is owed to the bank. Some are liquid, some are illiquid, that is to say loans to customers that are only available to the banks when the loans come due. And liabilities here, which are customer deposits and stockholder equity. So let's take a look at a loan. Jack takes out $10,000. He's going to buy a used car. And here's what's entered on the bank balance sheet. An asset of $10,000 as soon as this loan is made because Jack owes that amount of money to the bank. So it's an asset to the bank. It's also a liability in the sense that what the bank does is make that $10,000 available to Jack like establishing, putting it in his account, okay? And he can draw on that account and therefore it's a liability as well. So at this point, $10,000 of new money has been created by the bank. It has not been transferred from somewhere else or from someone else. And if Jack simply then wrote the check 
back to the bank for $10,000, these numbers would go to zero and the, the money effectively disappears. But of course, Jack wants to buy a car, so he's not going to write that check back to the bank. He's going to write it to Sam because he's going to buy the, buy the car from Sam. So now, uh, let's, uh, let's assume that for, mo for, the, for a minute that Sam banks at the same bank that Jack does. So now, the check goes to Sam. Sam takes it to the bank, and that's the same bank that Jack's bank, uh, where Jack banks. And all the, 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 uh, the bank has to do is transfer this liability from Jack's account, which is now flat because he just wrote this check for $10,000. And he wrote it to Sam, so t Sam's now got $10,000, so the liability is to Sam. The asset remains for the bank because Jack still has to pay the $10,000 back. Okay, now if Sam banks at a different bank than Jack, then that bank, upon receiving the check, would have told the Federal Reserve Bank to transfer $10,000 from the reserves of Jack's bank to the reserves of Sam's bank. So the Reserve Bank would now have a liability of $10,000 to Sam's bank instead of to Jack's bank. And what this means is the banking system acts like one big bank. Now, so the big picture then is the way money comes into, in, into the economy is from this process of loans, and then it's being fed back into the, the banks, essentially the financial sector here. And so you have a nice balance here, um, and that looks like it ought to work fine. And, and as long as the loans stay ahead of the repayment here, we should keep the system in money and the loans, uh, and, and we should keep the system afloat, and everything should But there are problems. Sometimes loan making slows down compared to the repayments, and now the money supply shrinks as money is going from the economy back into the financial sector, back to the banks, where it's sort of disappearing in a sense. Okay? So that's one problem, and this is what happens when we have recessions and depressions, that it's to say this process slows down compared to this process. So the second problem, of course, is the interest problem, and that is that the, uh, uh, the bank has created the $10,000 in principal, but it's asking for a repayment, of course, of the, the principal plus interest. So the question is, where does the borrower get the, the interest? And of course, a simple answer is, well, he's going to go work for it and get it somewhere. But where does the system get this interest in addition to uh, the, the principal? And the answer to that, of course, is there's only one source for more money for that interest to be paid, and it has to come from more loans. So this means that the interest demands more loans, which will demand yet more interest, requiring still more loans, and the money supply increases and debt rises as this process continues to move forward. And so this results in debt. You've seen many uh, examples of, 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 of debt per, uh, in the slides that other people have shown. This is simply data from uh, over a long period of time from 17 countries. And what you see is both pr uh, private bank lending here and public debt here, uh, the public debt spank, uh, spiking here of World War II. But here you see it rising in this uh, dramatic way. And this is expressed as percent of GDP. Okay. Well, you can say, wait a minute, uh, these interest payments, don't they, uh, where do they go? Um, don't they, these interest payments also get fed back into the uh, economy? And the answer is yes, uh, some of this interest does filter back into the economy, so that's this arrow here. But the, much of it stays in the financial sector as investments because uh, the, 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 this money is going to people who don't have to spend 80% income or 90 or 100 percent of their income on rent and food. So much of it can essentially be reinvested in the financial sector and doesn't come back into the real economy. So as money is created as debt, its distribution shifts into the financial sector while the real economy suffers from austerity. Now, I have a banker friend who, who says, no, I don't create money when I make, make loans. All I do is transfer it from reserve funds. And this is a figure taken from a recent paper from the Bank of England. Um, uh, and what shows here is in diagrammatic fashion what happens in terms of the balance sheets of the, t the two banks, the buyer's bank and the seller's bank. 
when this kind of transaction occurs. So here is the initial condition, the balance sheets before the loan is made, and it just shows these two banks as being equal. Now as a result of the loan being made, that the loan is made by the buyer's bank. So what you see is the buyer's bank creates a new loan, that's an asset, just like we said before, and a new deposit that the, that the buyer can use to buy this house or whatever, okay? Now, of course, what the uh, buyer does is he writes a check to the seller, okay? So now the seller gets this deposit, this check that's, that's, that's uh, deposited in, in that account. And what the, what the Federal Reserve does then is make a transfer of reserves from the buyer's bank to the seller's bank. So these two stay even here and these two uh, stay even here as well. So what we've seen from this point of view is it looks to the banker as though what he's done is not to create money. All he's done is use some of his reserves to make a loan. But of course, if he looks just at this half, that's what it looks like to him. But if he sees the whole picture, what's happening both in his bank and the other bank, then he can see that in fact he has created money by this transaction. But they like to look at it in the narrow way. Okay, uh, and th I found an interesting paper here um, uh, that bears on this question of whether banks really lend out reserves when they make loans, and the title of the paper gives you the conclusion of the paper. It says, repeat after me, banks cannot and do not lend out reserves. This is published in the radio direct, so I think this guy must have some expertise and he's addressing this problem in a very direct way. So, uh, consequences of the debt money system, and I think many of you are familiar with all of these things, and is of course amounts to an enormous growing mountain of public debt, both personal and corporate, a growing mountain of public debt with governments unable to maintain infrastructure and basic services, an unstable and unsustainable economic system, and a record concentration of wealth with increased poverty. The debt money system is unfair, it's unjust, it is destabilizing to society. There was an interesting interview uh, or exchange between uh, uh, Senator Sanders and Janet Yellen when she appeared before the Senate uh, committee. And Sanders asked her, uh, in the United States today, top 1% owns about 38% of the financial wealth of America, the bottom 60% own 2.3%. The senator ran down this harrowing description of the wealth gap in our nation, which has helped to shift all the power into the hands of an elite few. And he asked, are we still a capitalist democracy or have we gone over into an oligarchic form of society in which incredible economic and political power now rests with the billionaire class? And the Fed chair responded in this way. So, all of the statistics on inequality that you cited are one that greatly concern me. And I think for the same reason that you're concerned about them. They can shape they determine the ability of different groups to participate equally in the democracy and have grave so effects on social stability over time. Well, what are the suggestions that are made, that are generally made for this problem? There are a lot of suggestions that people make and you hear about these things from politicians. Some say fix the tax system, plug the loopholes that enable large profitable corporations to, to pay no tax. They argue, make it more steeply progressive as it was in the 50s with the highest rate, um, more than twice what it is now. Or change your practices of banking. Go to your credit unions or generate state banks or generate alternative currencies. And all of these are reasonable things to do, but none of them address the problem of creation of money as debt in the entire system. So the elements of monetary reform are really twofold. One is to take money creation away from banks, and secondly, establish a mechanism for money creation within the federal government. And these elements are written into the NEED Act, introduced into Congress in 2012. So the conclusion of all of this is simply that the current monetary system is unstable, it is unfair, and it is unsustainable in that it lies at the root of the increasing concentration of wealth into fewer and fewer hands, 
which is an unstable social condition. But monetary reform offers a fair system of money creation, a more stable economy, and the possibility of funding infrastructure repair and health care and other things without cutting other programs, without raising taxes, and without increasing federal debt. So my conclusion is that a consideration of monetary reform should now be part of the national conversation about how to make the future just and sustainable. Thanks. Leave it up for the question period. Leave it up for the question uh, Well, should we go to Nick now and, and then have questions? You prefer to do it that, that way? Either way. Yeah, okay. go, come on, Nick.